Uh, today we have Aaron with us, which is which is pretty terrific. Uh, Aaron is a very accomplished AI expert, and she is um, uh, is is really uh, outstanding in her field, and and it's a real blessing to have her with us. Aaron, um, let's start today's session by just talking a teeny bit about how you got into this world of AI. Uh, could you give us a, a little bit of a rundown of your career uh, to date? Sure. I actually started my career in marketing. Well, I'm a chartered professional accountant, but after that, <laughs> um, my love was in marketing and I spent a number of years in advertising and market research and general marketing. And eventually I became the chief operating officer of a fairly large advertising company in Canada. And when I was there, I wanted to move the company more into analytics. Right. And uh, that was difficult. It was a big company, so a lot of creative people, not so much into the analytics space. It was pretty early days. So I ended up, because a lot of our customers wanted that and I wanted to focus on that, I ended up leaving, starting my own company. Um, and we evolved from analytics to artificial intelligence. And of course, now it's, it's a big field and a very growing field. We've made incredible progress in those five years. And, uh, and we developed our own AI poly, which is patented, and, and now we're working with major brands across the world. It's and that's great. terrific. And I, I want to get into a little bit of what AI is, what AI is. And, um, you know, it's interesting you started as a, as a CPA, and, and um, you know, that's, uh, that's an interesting set of credentials as it relates to, to marketing. And I, I think that's uh, um, in, in particular around um, data, for sure. Um, let's talk about... AI a little bit. Uh, artificial intelligence is kind of, it grew up under the name of artificial intelligence. It's not, nothing artificial about it anymore. It's just, it's just, uh, it, it, it's, it's just intelligence. How, how would you define what AI is? We actually use the term for our AI, we call her alien intelligence as oh, okay. opposed to That's artificial great. because we really do see her as a member of our team. She is a being. It's just a different way of approaching things and thinking about things. And at the end of the day, if I were to really drill it down, Polly is a statistical machine, right? right. So she's, she's probabilities. So people who think like, we always say to our customers, don't, don't think this is a magic box. You have to, we work through a lot of agencies and stuff like that, who we train. It doesn't take a long time to train so that they can really understand that, it, that working with AI is a consultative process. She doesn't come up with the ad magically or what have you. You have to learn how to work with it. It does require the human creativity and intuition and thinking. And she feeds off of that and uses that to then create statistical models. So it really is a blending of those two talents. And you, if you're going to work with AI, need to understand the pros and cons and the limitations and the, the, the advantages that it brings so that you can work with it properly and integrate it properly. Interesting. And how did you come up with the name Polly? Was that, was that easy to come up with or did you, have, did you have a lot of names to choose from? How did that all work? You're going to be ashamed of me here from a branding perspective. So what happened was at, at the office, we used to, so each project is actually its own entity, right? Its own iteration. So we gave each project its own name when we, you know, so we had, we had Rocky for our Canadian tourism stuff and we had okay. Kai, which was, so we had all these different AIs and the Poly AI was actually for the British referendum um, on uh, Brexit. Okay. So, and we called her Polly because that was a political project. We just called her Polly. Okay. And then when I, we had tremendous success with Brexit. We were one of only 15 companies in the world to get that right. So we were doing the media interviews and one of the CBC interviewers right. said, you keep referring to the AI as she, does she have a name? And of course I hadn't tested this name or anything. And I said, yeah, actually her name is Polly. Um, well, after that, it was funny because then more customers would come in. We'd say, well, okay, now we're going to name your AI because we, you know, they'd have a name yeah. and so that they could feel personally uh, vested in it. And they said, well, I, I don't want enough. I want Polly. Like I want, I want the Bregs day. I want Polly to work on my project. Oh, yeah. And eventually we had to just always call her Polly yeah, um, and, and lose having other names. So unfortunately we didn't test that one. We didn't have no. a chance to really... Yeah, so that's why I say as a marketer, no, it's, it's well. I, I think it, I think it's brilliant, and I think uh, it means poly means many and it, in many applications. I think it works probably very very well. So you lucked out on that one, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't think we're going to be run by robots one day. Is it going to happen in your lifetime or in my lifetime? I don't think so. No, uh, I always go crazy when I see 
you know, on, on when I hear on the media that, that AI is composing music or writing novels, it's not the right application for AI. It really is a statistical machine. And we're very much in infancy with it, which is an opportunity for the folks in, you know, the Canadian Marketing Association, because actually marketing is one of the early adopters, but we're really at the very infancy. And so this idea that AI is going to cause World War III, I mean, that's something Elon Musk says, because he's trying to raise money for his company, right? And getting right. the government to invest in it. But we're, AI really, uh, it, it, it's very limited in what it's able to do. It's able to do those things really well. Um, and so, and I, what I say to people when they start getting scared, I think, I say, look at AI, 99% of applications for AI today are helping people, right? Google Maps, could you live without that? That's AI. Um, AI and detecting flu and, and, and all sorts of things, it's all there to, to help people, but it's always got human ingenuity behind it. That's great. Yeah, I, I, I think that's helpful for us to know. And, and it's just, it, I, I, my guess is it's garbage in, garbage out as well. So you have to be very careful Absolutely. with your meter. Yeah. So let's talk about COVID. We can't have a conversation these days without COVID coming up. It's, I'm sick of it. I'm sure you're sick of it. We're all sick of it. But one of the problems with COVID is that and that this pandemic is is that humans have been changed by it. So if you're going to introduce something during this period, it's really hard to go on statistical trends or or, or data collected prior to COVID. Would you say that's true? Yeah, absolutely. So with COVID, actually COVID has really unleashed the power of AI here, especially in marketing. So what we've been doing with our customers, we used to do um, market research, say monthly or quarterly and give them updates because that's how quickly things changed on average. These days with COVID, of course, things are changing daily. So, so first of all, the great advantage of AI, because we do, just to give a bit of background to, your, to, your, to the viewers, we're able to get perfect randomized controlled samples of populations on social media. So there's trillions of, of posts every day. So we're able to get information in almost real time. We're updating it dashboards for our customers daily and showing how things are changing. So the key innovation that we're using, which is the topic today for the COVID stuff is what's called lookalike sampling or lookalike right. audiences, which actually dates back to 2013, which is when it was first developed. Um, and it was developed to do all those things, you know, uh, people who bought this movie also bought this movie, right? That, right. you know, those were the early days of lookalike sampling right. and lookalike right. audiences. But it's much more sophisticated now because we've had seven years to develop it. And what we're doing now is because everybody's in a different place globally with COVID, um, we are able to create audiences, say, in Canada, in Toronto. So let's say you own a sports bar. You had a certain clientele. Uh, in Toronto and they come, they watch sports. Well, you know, sports isn't happening right now and people aren't gathering as much right now. So how do you make money? Well, we can create lookalike samples in other markets, say like in New Zealand or Australia where they're further ahead in the curve. Uh, the key here though, is to make sure that the people in those samples are identical except for where right. they live or as close to identical as possible. So you don't wanna be comparing a university professor in Toronto to a gun-toting IRA, NRA person in Texas, right. right? There are people in Texas who are like people in Toronto, so right. we can, and that's the, that's the hard part, is making sure that those audiences look alike, right. so that then you see, well, what worked in Australia? We can look at all of the restaurants in Australia who are ahead of the curve, they all employed different tactics, and which ones were successful, so we can apply them here. Great, well, that's, a, that's a very good description, and I think it's helpful. Um, I think you have an example that you that you want to put up uh, that, that kind of explains how this how this works and what what it doesn't do. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a very simple uh, example. So what we did here, this is actually we're allowed to share it because Government of Canada and everything they do because it's taxpayers' money. Yeah. So I'm not showing a brand here. Almost. Um, good. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, not the we stuff. Um, so. The, what they did, the Government of Canada put out a series of ads in 2019 to get people interested in the environment and sustainable development goals. Uh, the challenge, of course, in 2019, there was lots of stuff happening with the environment, right? We had Greta Thunberg was traveling all over, uh, right. Extinction Rebellion was holding demonstrations all over the world. So how do we know that these ads that the Government of Canada put out were effective uh, compared to all these other events? 
So what we did and was we created a lookalike sample. Uh, in this case, we created a sample of people in, in different states, Chicago was one of them, in the United States where they had exposure to Greta Thunberg and all those other things, but they did not see the Canadian ads. And then we compared them to a sample in Canada where we had high probability, not that they saw the ads, not only because they were in Canada, but we have other techniques to know that people saw these ads. And then we went back to before the ads ran and we looked at these samples and we compared them and then after the ads ran, right after the ads ran, a month after the ads ran, so we're able to see the effectiveness. And with very high accuracy, we're able to tell the government that your ad agency did a great job in this particular case, um, that the ads in Canada were three times more effective on the same types of people. So these are people who had the same interest in environmental issues. So it's not because people in the US don't care as much. These were people who had the same level of interest in environmental causes going into before the ad campaign started, because here's another important part. We can go back in time as if it were 2012, right? Right. Because we can go all the way back to 2012. So we went before the ads went, same level of interest, but the Canadians showed three times more after being exposed to these ads. So in this case, this was issued by the Auditor General of Canada. Uh, they said high marks, three times more effective. The ads were very effective. We've had other times where ads weren't as effective. So uh, this is great for anybody in marketing who wants to very precisely, because I know I come from the advertising background, the thing that my customers would always say is, how do I know it's because of your ads and not because I put air conditioning in my store or you know whatever it is. Right. Um, we can now show with very high confidence when an ad is successful and tell you exactly how successful it was. So it's really a form of uh, market research uh, on steroids to a degree. Um, mm -hmm. but, but people don't know they're participating. Uh, it, it's, you're, you're watching what we're doing and hopefully not through my camera, but um, uh, but you're watching what I'm doing and, 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 I, and I've made myself available by posting things on social media and it's the collection of all that. What are people's concerns around privacy as it relates to that? Do you hear that question come up very often? All the time and it's a really important uh, issue. So we do a lot of work with the government and with Health Canada. So we've had the tires kicked on us from a privacy perspective. We're actually uh, we do a lot of work in, in advocating for digital privacy online. You can see it if you Google us. So here's the important point. Not only is uh, creeping people out, individuals and micro-targeting creepy from a privacy point of view, it's actually bad science. Okay, so I like to use the analogy of there are two types of professions that do market, or sorry, that do prediction, right? One right. is a psychic. So you go to the psychic, she says, John, you're going to meet the person of your dreams. You're going to get. You're going to win the lottery. Right. Uh, she gives you this nice prediction. You walk out of her tent and you get hit by a car. Her business is illegitimate, right? And that's why psychics don't make a lot of money. Well, some right. of them do, but you know what I mean. She's going to be right sometimes, maybe yeah. five percent of the yeah. time, because that's chance, right? But she's not scientifically correct. Now there is another profession that does have scientific accuracy, and they're called actuaries. Now, an actuary will look at you for an insurance policy saying, John, your parents lived to 102, you don't smoke, you don't drink, you live a great lifestyle, I'm going to give you a million dollar life insurance policy, you walk out of his office, get hit by a car, that's okay, not okay that you got hit by a car, but uh, yeah. that's okay well, because he's got, right, because he's got 30,000 more people like you, so he's not, he's not trying to tell me what's going to happen to John. Because what's going to happen to John, even John doesn't know what's going to happen to John, okay? Right. You may, you're going to make plans next week. You may be made plans in March, okay? And those plans right. all go awry. So what we're trying to do here is population-level research, just like Statistics Canada does. We don't collect any names because that's better science. We are going to be wrong sometimes, too. Polly is sometimes wrong. She's wrong 5 to 6% of the time. But 95% of the time, she's correct. And so right. we can tell you, this is how well this ad is going to play in this market. Uh, this is how well it played. And we'll, we'll have high accuracy. But if we're going to tell you what you're going to do next week, I will have very low accuracy. Very good. Well, I'm heading to the mountains the next week. We'll see how that goes. That's what you uh, think. That's what you yeah. think. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's step back a little bit from the, uh, the actual science of it all and, and go to the application. So... When people come to you for help, do they know what they want? What type of things are they coming to chat with your company about? 
you know, there's, there's the ones who don't know what they want and they admit they don't know what they want. And then there's folks who say they know what they want. And then as they start to get results, inevitably these things change. And the best way to come into this is with an open mind. So we have, so we can go all uh, avenues of the scale. I always say it's best to start from, it doesn't cost you any extra to start from bare basics. Like basically once you're trained on the issue, there's all sorts of methodologies and tools we can use that are, it's, it's trading on the issue that where the cost is. So the other tools and methodologies don't cost you extra. So we would say to our customers, start with what's called topic discovery. So in a survey, uh, you have to ask people questions. You have to know what questions to ask. So I'll give you a, a very clear example. We were doing some work with some uh, uh, manufacturers of electric automobiles, right? The, the, the main car companies. And there's very low take rate on purely electric vehicles, like one to 2%. Right. And they couldn't understand why. So uh, one of the things that we did a lot, a lot of studies, we found that the current owners of the automobiles aren't great ambassadors. And they said, well, this is crazy. We survey our customers all the time and they say they love the vehicles. I said, yes, but who is buying these vehicles, right? Greta Thunberg is buying these vehicles. They are the one to 2% of the environmentally right. conscious population, right? So when they start talking about the, uh, you know, they have to download a different app for every charging station they go to and um, that when the price of electricity goes up, that's okay. They don't mind paying way more for electricity than for gas. Right. And each charging station charges a different kind of car. Well, that's annoying to 98% of the population. It's right. not to the 2%. So we said there, so instead of trying to get more people to buy these cars, you actually have to improve the infrastructure. That was a huge aha moment for them because they didn't realize what an annoyance this was because Yes, the people who bought the cars love the cars, and the cars hardly ever break down. By the way, they're terrific cars. Um, so, but you, so for topic discovery is for people who don't know what might be annoying their customers, and they just want Polly to glean it from right. all the conversations about their product and their competitors' products. So we always say start there, build an audience from there. Who's your current audience? But who's your aspirational audience? Like who can we get next? Because there's the people we can get in three years, right? That's not your aspirational audience. Your aspirational audience is who can we get in the next one to two quarters if with just a bit of tweaking and messaging and a bit of understanding of their issue or right. understanding the weakness of the competition and then we move from there. That's interesting. I do have a question that's come in here um, and this specifically, uh, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rephrase the question a little bit, but like, what are people coming to you in the last, three months and with some of the quite without giving away you know, confidentiality what are some of the questions that they're asking give me some examples of what AI, how ai can help it in this specific instance of things related to covid uh so the the two main things that people are asking us about now is what's working and what's not in my industry can you do sort of like a global scan and tell me what's been okay. working in other places with global audiences and the other one is uh, from a messaging perspective, what is it that people want to hear? How do I get people to wear masks, for instance? So right. if you don't mind, I'd love to share with you a little screen. This is something we did about a month ago. This is COVID related. Um, this was messaging we did. So um, one of our brands, and you'll see here, it's all redacted because I, I can't share who this was, but they were running messaging in newspapers and on TV about COVID and trying to um, you know, get some messages across. And we were, Polly was looking at, well, which things, which communications worked and which ones didn't work and which ones had no effect. So what's interesting is, so where you see the pink boxes is where there was an effect. So up here, even though we see a peak here in some of these areas, that's a peak that's caused by other things, not by this organization. So it's important, it's called a change point analysis where we can tell you that it's because of your ad or your communication that something changed. So most of the time their ad is not making a difference, but in here, the communications were making a difference. So here something happened, they made an announcement and people got positive and they, and they adopted the change that they asked. Here, when they put out some communication in the Toronto Sun, it actually, got the, the opposite reaction that they wanted. So Polly is saying that was not an effective communication. Then uh, here in National Post, also not an effective communication. We kept changing the communication. We put one, it's not because of the papers, by the way, it's the communication itself. Uh, we put out this one in the Globe. It had a you know, bit of a bump, then we went down again. And then we did this where CTV, where we hit it out of the park, okay? So this is what's really important. We can tell you right away 
um, when the messaging that you are putting out is having the desired effect. People are adopting the behavior that you want them to adopt. And so, you know, it's, um, and we could also test these messages ahead of time too, like, like some of them, some of the ones that they did, they had put out before we came on. We got better with testing the messages and now it's actually, because this was done about, actually this is two months ago. Now it's really, you know, it's yeah. doing well. We know how to get the behavior that we want each time. So those are the two main yeah. things that people want and they want it every day because right. things are really changing every day right. with the news. Right. And I guess that when you look at the, the internet chart, it, it, one of the beneficial applications of AI is efficiency of spend. So if, if you get the right information out and you can do, do some predictive analysis, you can make smarter decisions. You don't have to sp kind of spray and pray. You can be a little more um, uh, specific on your, on, on your tactics. Um, yeah. What are some of the uh, misunderstandings that people have about coming to see you, about doing some work with you? Um, you know, they, 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 do some people come and say, I, I'm not sure I can help. I don't have a lot to bring along with me. Or is there any of those types of discussions? Yeah, so, so a few things. Um, number one, the number one error is to think that Polyage is going to solve the issue, right? It really right. is a consultative thing, as I kind of mentioned earlier. Right. Um, she, uh, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an example. We were working with a brand and um, sometimes the AI will un unveil some things where she's taking in information. So for example, we had a profession, we were asking, are they good financial managers? And normally they were seen to be good financial managers, they get a high score. In this particular case, the score came down. And they said, well, why would that be? We've always been seen to be good financial managers. And I said, well, when we went back, Polly was saying, I asked this professional about Bitcoin, and she didn't know. Is Bitcoin something that this profession right, right. should have some expertise in? And they actually had to discuss it for 45 minutes. And they decided, yeah, we, we should start training our people on Bitcoin. Okay. And that was something they didn't know before because before financial was just tax audit investment, right? But now, but that world is changing. So yeah. you have to be part of it and tell us and tell Polly what we should be considering and what we should not be considering. Um, the other uh, aspect, well, there's training. So making sure that she's, so that she's trained properly and she's not getting biased in what she does. Right. Um, so it's very, very important that um, when you're working with AI that you see it as a partnership. It's not a off the shelf software where we come in and we say, just do this and it's gonna solve all your problems. You have to always be tweaking it, yeah. measuring and getting it better. What about, um, my guess is there's been a lot of companies that, that made significant, like really significant investments in data, in their own data and um, do you have people coming along saying, like, can you match my data up to this social data and try to make sense of it all? And how do you respond to those types of questions? I actually say that um, you've actually, our customers who come to us with no data actually do better than the ones that have rings yeah, sure. and rings of it. So loyalty cards, very, very expensive, right? Two to 3% of revenue. And that data is out of date literally in three months. Wow. Um, so it's, uh, we, our customers, because, and you don't need it now, right? With, with social, you've got people telling you exactly what they think all the time. Why do you want to get something that's two, three months old, right. um, or two, three weeks old, even when you can get something that came out in the last hour. So being able to sample properly, you don't have to waste your two to 3% of revenue. Um, that data goes out of date. People get married, they move, they die, they graduate. Yeah. As soon as that happens, it changes. You get married, you're not drinking the same wine anymore, right? Yeah. Um, no, you're right. not eating the same food anymore. Whether you, so, um, so every life event changes and then your data is completely irrelevant. You've spent so much money on it. If you're spending more than say, this, this kind of engagement will cost you less than typical market research. So you're, you're looking at 15,000 to get started, you know, depending on how often you want the updates, are, are people who are getting daily tracking and updates on COVID are spending about $10,000 a month, which is low for what you're getting. I mean, so- Sure versus the yep. quantitative research. Um, the dashboard would be like 3,000 a month if you're not making changes and tracking. Yeah, that's interesting. 
Uh, we're going to run out of time here really quickly. It's been fascinating chatting with you. I know that there will be some people there watching this that will say, I want to be just like Aaron Kelly. How, how, how do I stay uh, close to the world as it evolves? What are some of the what some of the what some of the learning that I should participate in now in order to be a good AI professional in the future? Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, so we uh, we do work in our company. It'll take it we can spend a day with a marketing team and get them so up to speed on AI, they would be experts in their field. The great thing here is that we're at the 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 very beginnings of this industry. And the really cool part for marketers is that marketing is actually one of the leading applications of AI today. So we hear about AI in surgery and AI in self-driving cars. Well, there are no commercially available AIs for self-driving cars right now, right? There are commercially available AIs for marketing. And the great part is it's the same principles. So if you learn about sampling and the, and the statistics of AI for marketing, you can apply it to cybersecurity and self-driving cars. So I would say this is an amazing time for marketers. It's not math heavy. I wanna make sure that I make that clear. I'm not gonna come in and give you a calculus lesson. I can literally teach you, I come from a marketing background, so I can teach you the principles of AI marketing, come in, I'll probably do it on a Zoom these days, right? So maybe you break it up into three, two hour sessions. But just so you know, we take people who are marketers and accountants, we bring them into our company, within three months, they're programming the AI. Okay, so that's how quick it is to get into this. Interesting, and I assume that the science, like any type of research is statistics, and and really having a fundamental grasp on statistics. And I know that a lot of people um, struggle with the notion of, of st statistics and the science behind it, and the, but it's really not that difficult to learn, particularly when you have applications for it so readily. That's, that's it. So what we do is we come in and we teach you statistics from a marketing perspective. If I were teaching you uh, statistics from a disease management perspective, you, your eyes would gloss over, okay? But when I'm showing it to you yeah. in the, for what you do for a living, trust me, the math becomes secondary to you. It really does, people are learning this stuff. 